Hi everyone, my name is Neha Simon. I'm an eighth year MD PhD student at the University of Pennsylvania, and I'll tell you all a little bit about what that means in just a moment. And today I'd like to take you on a walk down my memory lane and talk a little bit about my research on Alzheimer's disease. But first, a little bit about me. As I mentioned, I'm in an MD PhD program at Penn. I'm originally from Allentown, Pennsylvania, and I actually did my undergrad at the University of Pennsylvania as well, where I studied neuroscience. And that's when I decided that I would do an MD PhD. So what exactly is an MD PhD? Well, it's a little bit exactly like what it sounds like. It's a combined degree where you can do get both a medical degree, so you could be a doctor that sees patients and takes care of them in the hospital. And you can also get a graduate degree called a PhD where you can do research in a lab. And this is, might be like what you see in the movies with the scientists and the lab coats and goggles and the beakers. That's actually pretty much what I did for my PhD. And so to tell you a little bit about my training path, I started the MD-PhD program at the University of Pennsylvania back in 2012, and my path is pretty similar to what most programs are like in the country, which is that I did two years of medical school initially, and then I started my PhD in neuroscience um, in 2014, and that's what I'll tell you a little bit more about what I did there. Four years later, I graduated from that and went back to medical school, and I'll be graduating medical school in just under a month, and will be starting a job as a doctor, as a neurologist in St. Louis. And so one thing you might think when looking at this whole path is it seems pretty long. And it was. It was actually a whole eight years. And you might ask, why would anybody spend that much time studying? Well, there are a couple reasons I think that it's a good idea. One thing is that I really love everything that I do, and I'll tell you a little bit more in detail about that over the course of this talk. But I really enjoy being able to see patients and treat them. But one thing I learned is that there are a lot of diseases like Alzheimer's in which there are really no treatments or cures for the patients. And so there's really not much we can offer them. And so I really wanted to also be able to work behind the scenes and do some type of research. And so actually doing experiments and trying to find and discover new treatments and new ways of managing these diseases. And that's where doing a PhD and being a scientist comes in. And so really, I think this is the best way to blend both careers. And so that's why I was really happy to go through this entire process. And the other side of it is that luckily, most MDPhD programs will pay your way through school. So they'll pay for both medical school and graduate school. And so that's kind of nice to get sort of like a full ride, even though you're spending a lot of time doing school. So I want to spend the next little bit of time telling you a little bit about what I did my PhD on. And as I mentioned, I worked on Alzheimer's disease. A lot of you may have heard of Alzheimer's because you may have a family member, maybe a grandparent that was diagnosed with it. And that's not so surprising. It actually, over 5 million people in the US actually have Alzheimer's disease currently. And it's the most common cause of something called dementia, which I'll explain in just a moment. For those of you who may know someone with Alzheimer's, you may have a sense of what kind of symptoms that they have. They often start off with a loss of memories. They might forget recent things that happened maybe a conversation that you had with them the day ago. And they may even start to forget who their family and friends are. They may even stop recognizing you when you go to visit them. Over time, they might have trouble speaking, and eventually they get to the dementia part of the disease. And this is where they just have trouble doing everyday things that we take for granted. Things like being able to feed ourselves, bathe ourselves, even go out and hang out with our friends. And people with Alzheimer's just really aren't able to do any of that. So as you can imagine, it's a pretty devastating disease to live with, not just for the person going through it, but also for their family and friends around them. Unfortunately, right now, we just don't really have any treatments or cure for Alzheimer's. And that's where I got really interested in wanting to study it as a scientist. In order to understand what causes Alzheimer's, we have to go to where Alzheimer's disease starts, and that's in the brain. We have to be a little bit like detectives and really investigate what's happening inside the brain in someone with Alzheimer's. And I've been very lucky, the lab that I worked in had a lot of people who were generous enough that when they passed away, to, that said they would donate their brain for research. And so one of the coolest things about what I do is that we have this huge bank of human brains. And I actually get to hold and touch and work with human brains on a daily basis. And that's pretty cool. One thing we found when we looked at the brains of people with Alzheimer's is that they look totally different than the brains of just normal healthy people. You can see here in this picture that somebody with Alzheimer's disease, their brain is just completely shrunken down and just looks terrible in comparison to the healthy brain on the left. 
we wanted to understand what is causing the brain and Alzheimer's to shrink like that, because that's probably what's causing all the symptoms that these patients are having. So we have to take an even closer look to be able to do that and really take a look with a microscope. And when we did, we saw two things. They were called plaques and tangles. And they kind of look like a stain on your shirt. And that's exactly actually what they are. They're sort of like a stain on the brain. There are these proteins that clump together where they're not supposed to. And in normal people, they don't have these plaques and tangles, but people with Alzheimer's do. And we think they're the ones that are causing the brain to shrink up so much and causing all these devastating symptoms. In my lab in particular, we wanted to understand what the tangles were doing in the brain and how they were possibly causing the brain to shrink. But to do this, we have to have some way to experiment with Alzheimer's. But as you can imagine, I don't think you'd be very happy if I came to you and said, hey, I'm gonna go and poke around inside your brain. And we didn't think anybody would be very happy if we did that. So it's really hard, we can't experiment on people. So we have to have some other way of understanding these diseases. And one thing the scientists use is something called a model. This is often some type of animal research where we will do experiments with animals and then try to see if that can apply to people. And one of the most common animals that we'll use is mice, just because they're really easy to work with. And so a lot of what I did for my research was to take those human brains I talked about and literally take the tangles from those human brains and put them into a teeny tiny little needle and then take just a live ordinary mouse, put it to sleep so it doesn't feel any pain or anything and inject those tangles from the human brains directly into the brains of these tiny mice. Then we can just wake the mouse up and it'll go about and do what it was normally doing. And over some time, we can take a look to see if the mice develop the same tangles that we see in the human brain. And that's exactly what we found. So here's a scale of what a mouse brain looks like compared to a human brain. And you can see that the human brain is huge in comparison to a mouse brain. And so mice brains are really, really tiny and really, really hard to work with. So we really have to take use of our microscope. And so a lot of what I did was take these teeny tiny mouse brains, cut them up so that I can put them on a little glass slide and take a look at them under the microscope. So we can see if the mice are developing the same tangles that we saw in humans. And as I mentioned, that's exactly what we saw. If we look closely, we see something that looks exactly like a stain, that stain tangle that we saw in one of the earlier slides in the humans, that's exactly what we see in the mice. So it was pretty cool that we were able to essentially give a mouse Alzheimer's. But you might ask, well, how can we be sure that these mice have the same like memory problems that people have? How can we even test the memory of a mouse? It turns out we can test the memory of a mouse. And the way to do it is that we have these really cool tasks that we can train the mice to do and see what their memory is like. One of these tasks is called the Morris water maze. I'll show you a little bit of what that looks like. What it is, is a giant vat of water that you'll see. And in it is gonna be a hidden platform that you'll see in just a moment. So here's that giant vat of water and there's the hidden platform. And you can put the mouse in the water and mice can swim. There's that mouse right there swimming around. But mice don't love to swim and they don't really love the water and getting wet. So they really wanna get out of that water as quickly as possible. But this mouse has no clue where the hidden platform is. It doesn't even know there's a hidden platform. So it's just swimming around, trying to see if there's some way for it to escape. We're speeding it up and it's still swimming around, still trying to figure out if there's some way for it to escape. But like I said, it doesn't know where it is. This is kind of like maybe you going to a new place for the first time and you've never been there. And you have no GPS, no map, nothing. You have to figure out where that place is. You're gonna totally be wandering around just like this mouse is, just wandering everywhere, no clue where you're going. What you might need is somebody to come show you exactly where you need to go, and that's what this lady does. She comes and puts the mouse on the platform so that it learns where the platform is. So that over time, now the mouse has learned where the platform is. It's been doing this task over and over, over multiple days. So this is like after you've learned exactly where that new place is, and you don't even need GPS or map. As soon as the mouse goes into the water, it goes right to where the platform is. So now it's learned how to do this task. And how did it learn it? Well, it has memories. It remembered where the platform was from the day before. And in that same way, we can test to see how good a mouse's memory is. 
So now if we give the mice Alzheimer's, we find that actually that mouse doesn't do so well on these memory tasks. That mouse is not able to find where that platform is no matter how many times you teach it, no matter how many times you train it, it just never learns. And that's because its memories are just really bad and just never really remembers where that platform is. And so this is one way that we can actually now see an entire model of Alzheimer's. So what the patients are experiencing, we could do the same thing in a mouse. And I think that's pretty cool. But what's even cooler is what we can actually do with that type of model. And what we can do with it is that we can start to test therapies in the mice first to see if they work before we can give them to people. So can we do the same thing we did before where we're putting these tangles into the mouse brain, but in the meantime, while the mice are kind of running around doing their thing, we can treat them. And there are a lot of people, including people in our lab, they're developing new drugs and new therapies for Alzheimer's. So we can treat the mouse and then see, can we reduce the number of tangles in the brain? Do the mice do better on these memory tests? And if they do, then that might mean that the drug is working. And if it works in mice, then we could try to see if it also works in people. And this, I think, is the coolest part of being a medical scientist and an MD-PhD, is I can participate in all aspects of this. I can do the mouse work and do the experiments we just talked about. I can come up with the therapies and the treatments to then test in the mice. And then if they work in mice, I can go and also see if they work in people. And if we finally do find a treatment, I can then go and as a doctor, treat those patients with Alzheimer's disease. And so the best part of what I do is to be able to do all of these things together. And I think that's why being a medical scientist is one of the coolest jobs you can have. So I'd like to thank you all for taking the time to listen to this mini lesson by a medical scientist. If you have any questions, my email is below. Feel free to email about if you have any questions on whether doing medical school, graduate school, Alzheimer's disease, anything that you like. And I hope that this was both fun and informative for you. Thank you.